out. What an exciting evening. How awesome. Um, thank you, Paula, for coming. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. Of course. Um, I would like to welcome you and to introduce Catherine from the Vancouver Art Gallery, who will continue with introductions. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you guys all for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. We're thrilled to see you all here today. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are situated on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And on behalf of the Vancouver Art Gallery, I would like to extend our appreciation to live and learn on this land. My name is Catherine Dennis, and as the Adult Public Programs Coordinator at the Vancouver Art Gallery, I have had the great pleasure to be involved in organizing tonight's talk. We welcome Paola Antonelli, Senior Curator at the Museum of Modern Art in the Department of Architecture and Design, as well as MoMA's Founding Director of Research and Development, and we're thrilled to have her here in Vancouver. After the talk, we will have time for audience questions. Microphones will be placed in the aisle, and we invite you to come up to those to ask questions, and I'll let you know when we run out of time. And that is because we're recording tonight's talk for all the guests who weren't able to join us here today. I'd like to take a minute to extend our deep gratitude to Nancy and Neil Benson and Inform Interiors for taking an immediate enthusiastic interest in bringing Paula here to speak. Thank you to Intercorp and to the Timothy C. Kerr Family Foundation for your very generous support, and to our event hotel sponsor, the Fairmont Pacific Rim. And of course, a big thank you to the whole team at Inform for hosting tonight's talk. Without all of your valuable contributions, we could not have pulled this event off. Tonight's talk, The New Frontiers of Design, is presented in conjunction with the exhibition Mashup, The Birth of Modern Culture, which has seen record-breaking attendance. This exhibition offers an international survey of mashup culture, documenting the emergence and evolution of a mode of creativity that has grown to become one of the dominant forms of cultural production in the early 21st century. All four floors of Mashup are on view until May 15th, after which the top two floors remain open while we prepare for our summer exhibition, Picasso, the Artist and His Muses. And it is now my great pleasure to welcome Senior Curator Bruce Granville to properly introduce Paula. Welcome, Bruce. Uh, thank you, uh, Catherine, and, and uh, thank you all for, for coming this evening. I'm, I want to say thank you to Catherine because it, these big events are, are always a challenge to, to produce, and, and it's, it's an especial uh, effort to, to produce this one, so th thank you, Catherine. And I, it doesn't hurt to repeat the thanks to the sponsors who uh, have been, um, well, it really, literally, made this possible tonight. We couldn't have done it uh, without Inform Interiors, certainly Intracorp, uh, the Timothy, Timothy C. Kerr Family Foundation, who really uh, come together to make this kind of event possible, and uh, it's, it's an extraordinary a gift in, in many ways. I want to give a special thanks to uh, Nancy and Niels Benson, um, who are so supportive of design and visual culture in the community. Over the years, I've, I've benefited greatly from their, their thoughtful advice, their open-handed loans, uh, their generous support of exhibitions and their enthusiastic efforts to build a rich network of makers and users that support contemporary design and, and visual culture. Uh, their ongoing lecture series hosted here uh, at Inform is, is legendary. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, this, the, their presentation of Bruce Mao's 2002 lecture at Inform Interiors in conjunction with the release of his book Lifestyle was the catalyst for Bruce Mao's massive change, the future of global design. Based on the extraordinary ideas that he expressed in his talk uh, that night, we invited him to produce an exhibition on what he described as the already changed world of design, a world where design shaped and defined every aspect of our lives. This seemed an audacious, audacious statement, and our invitation to prove it uh, resulted in the production of our 2004 Massive Change exhibition and book a project that still seems is seen as a notable landmark in the contemporary design history. Tonight's talk by Paola Antonelli will undoubtedly mark another milestone within this well-established program of discourse on design and fundamental role of, uh, and its fundamental role in contemporary life. We are delighted uh, that Niels and Nancy offered to co-host this event here tonight. Paola Antonelli is a senior curator at MoMA's Department of Architecture and Design, where she has worked since 1994. 
She also founded and directs their research and design department, which was established in 2012. She's a celebrated lecturer and an accomplished writer and a key figure in establishing an engaging and meaningful online presence for design as a discourse and as a practice. Paola Antonelli's exhibitions and research on canonical designers of the modern age are highly regarded and have provided insight into the process, materials, and meanings of work by designers such as Achille Castiglione or Hella Jungaris. But it is, it is her work to expand our vision and understanding of contemporary design that con defines her contribution to the history of modern and contemporary culture. Exhibitions such as Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design from 1995, produced in the same year she designed MoMA's first website, or Safe Design, Safe Design Takes on Risk from 2005, pushed the representation of design toward issues of radical experimentation, socially engaged research, and aff affective meaning. Exhibitions such as Design in the Elastic Mind from 2008, or Design and Violence, launched in 2013, itself a unique exper experiment in designing an online exhibition. These have, result have invited us to consider the consequences of design. Through these exhibitions, we are reminded that design is a powerful force and that it must be practiced with considered intent, ethical intelligence, and compassionate purpose. It's no coincidence that we've invited Paola Antonelli to speak here at, at the time of our exhibition mashup, The Birth of Modern Culture. We've done so because we recognize her important role as a leading advocate and articulate critical voice for the understanding and support of new modes of creativity that have emerged in the 21st century. While recognizing that this new creativity has its roots in the formal and social innovations of the 20th century, Paola Antonelli points to radical and decisive shifts in design that have opened the door to new and meaningful modes of cultural production. Please join me in welcoming Paola Antonelli. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce, for this amazingly thoughtful and great introduction. And thank you, Nancy and Niels, for hosting me here. And thank you, Catherine, for truly a wonderful organization. Today, I had the delight of being taken around by Bruce and Stephanie to see Mashup. And I was so impressed because it reminded me of what curators do, which is, of course, to have a gaze on the past and be able to synthesize what happened in the past. But first and foremost, curators of contemporary art try to take a look at today, at what's happening in our time, and try to figure out what some lines, some red threads could be that they could share with the public. And that's what happens in places like the Vancouver Art Gallery or like the Museum of Modern Art, which were created to look at the past but also at the present. Part of the mission of the Museum of Modern Art is to collect and display the art of our time. And that's what we try and do most of the time. And sometimes the art of our time turns to design. Well, design has been part of the Museum of Modern Art's mission since the very beginning. You know, the museum was founded in 1929, and the founding director, who was in his late 20s at that time, had just taken the grand tour of Europe, had been at the Bauhaus, and had seen that the unity of the arts, all the arts coming together, including photography, quite a discovery at that time, including movies, including design and architecture, could make everybody's life better. <clears throat> and on that principle, the museum set out to focus on the art of our time. Of course, our time became a little bit of a past, and you know, at the very beginning, you might not know it, but part of the mandate of the museum was to collect art of our time, and then when it would get older than 60 years, give it to the Met. That worked for the first two paintings, and then they stopped, they changed the rule. But anyway, even though that was not happening, we um, set out to collect that way. And also in the past 20 years, I've been in MoMA for 22 years, we tried to follow that particular mandate. That's why you know, Bruce reminded us of some of the exhibitions, some that I did, some that my colleagues did, but you see here some images, mutant materials, it's 
is at the top left, and it was an exhibition that tried to show how the center of gravity of design had switched, and designers themselves could customize the materials that used to be once upon a time the purview of engineers and, uh, uh, and industrialists. So it was about designers taking more control. And if you don't know it, my uh, Twitter handle is Curious Octopus, and my motto is designers on top. So I think that that was one of the first signals of that. And then ever since, we tried to move, and say we, my colleagues and I, tried to move more and more into an expanded view of design that also encompasses digital design, the digital realm, uh, logos, symbols, fonts, all of the bits and pieces and the interstitial tissues of design that come to form our inhabited environment, our built environment. Um, I like to say to people that I consider architecture a form of design. To some, it's a little blasphemous, but maybe I was taught that way because I went to the Polytechnic of Milan, where we were 15,000 students when I was going to school, and so there was no no possibility of doing anything practical. We had to stay in line 20 minutes to go to the second floor. So it was all very <laughs> theoretical. It was all very theoretical, and there was this theory of design that would then apply to all different scales and all different uh, materials. So architecture is a branch of design. But along the years, both in exhibitions and in the collection, we started collecting, of course, inter interaction design, and then you might know about the video games, all sorts of different uh, materials. And we started looking at design in a different way, not anymore as a series of different branches coming together, but rather as a series of ideas that were carried through and new attitudes of contemporaneity that were carried through amongst all the different forms of design. And you'll see them more as I go through the, our lecture today. But amongst the objects that we either collected or that we considered for exhibitions were uh, cheese made with human bacteria taken from people's armpits, and uh, 4D printed dresses, and towers made with bricks made of mushroom mycelium and corn stalks. So you see really the center of gravity changes and also the materials of design changes. And that's why I always try to make people become non-denominational when it comes to design and to really think not of what the object is, because the object has changed, but rather at the attitude of the designer and what the object adds to the world. You know, sometimes people ask as curators, how do you select an object for the MoMA collection? And do you know, there's no recipe. Of course, you look at the form, you look at the function, you look at the meaning, you look at the context. You know the whole spiel when it comes to design. But I always say that the litmus test is, close your eyes and think, if this object did not exist, would it be a pity? Does it add something to the world? And you'll see that that particular litmus test sometimes works also with perfectly superfluous objects that are delightful, while some absolutely functional object might as well not exist and we would survive. So it's really interesting. It gives a different balance of the importance of design. What I think that we need to understand more than anything, and I know it's not going to be easy for you all to look at this slide, so I'm just going to tell you, don't worry too much, just see the two columns. The column on the left is before, and the column on the right is after, and it's about how design has changed. This is a slide that is used a lot by my great friends Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby. You might know about them, they are two uh, exquisite theoreticians of design and educators. They uh, kind of were the parents of the discipline of speculative and critical design today. They left the Royal College of Art and have now moved to New York City. And they always talk about the power of design to disclose possible consequences of our choices of today by looking at scenarios and speculation. In this really interesting image and slide. They show how design used to be once upon a time when we used to think that form followed function, right? So for instance, just to read you the, few, the, the first line, it used to be affirmative, today design is critical. Once upon a time, design used to be about problem solving. How many times have we heard that? And today, it is sometimes about problem finding or about framing the problem in the right way. Or in the past, design used to be about 
changing the world to suit us, and today instead it's about changing us to suit the world. Interestingly, there is a shift in balance and a shift in center of gravity also in these definitions of design that you might see reflected in the way you live life these days. The sense of responsibility and of citizenry that so many of us feel burning inside, the sense of a uh, kind of skeptical optimism about the future. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I believe in the sixth extension, and I believe that design can help us design a more graceful exit, so the next species will remember us more fondly. Uh, but it really is something that has changed tremendously, and you see in the fifth line from the bottom, it's design as it used to be, used to be about consumers, and today it's about citizens. Even that is so important, and I'm trying to eliminate the word consumer from everything that I do, so that those little exercises that might look as if they were nomenclature really change us inside. The new frontiers of design reflect this move, this new dynamic, and reflect the fact that whether it's furniture, critical, interface, video game, design shares throughout these different fields attitudes that are the most important ones. So first and foremost, design is critical. It's critical of real facts. This is a beautiful poster by the company Volontaire for Amnesty International that was about denouncing female genital mutilation and about denouncing it, but at the same time being publishable also in Islamic countries. So it is a subtlety and a violence that is part of this form of design and neither reneges aesthetics. What I think is very important is that even when design is activist at its most, when it's good, it's also about form, because form is a matter of communication, because beauty is a sign of respect towards your fellow human beings. And it's not the beauty that we used to know. It's about really the effort of having an aesthetic intention. Design is critical when it highlights hidden facts about the way we live. This is a beautiful visualization designed by Laura Kurgan, who is a professor at Columbia University and has a lab at Columbia University. It shows a phenomenon that happens in many American cities. They're called million-dollar blocks. They are blocks in inner cities of the United States for which the government, whether local or federal, spends at least a million dollars every year to keep some of the inhabitants of the block either in prison or in halfway houses, anyway, kept out of society for the uh, alleged protection of society. But it's, a, it's almost like a set of financial, fin financial measuring of social entropy. And there are so many of these blocks. There are about 350 of these blocks in Brooklyn, in the borough of Brooklyn alone in New York. Now, you might read it, in the newspaper in the morning and be outraged for 20 minutes and then forget it. But if you see a map of Brooklyn with these blood red dots on it, all of a sudden it'll stay with you and it will remain engraved in your memory forever. That's the power of design, to be critical and not forgettable, unforgettable. And that's a way to also be activist. So much of design is activist these days. And the activism can sometimes be subtle and under your skin. This is Electroland, um, Cameron McNall from Los Angeles. It's, a, it's an old project that I really love. So many architectural students go through the exercise of designing homeless shelters. It's a very urgent issue. It's an issue that can be tested on the ground where the students live. And it's a form of mini architecture that is at the same time really inspiring and urgent and also possible. Also prototypes can be built. And usually the solutions are great, but what Cameron did, and he was already a professor, not a student, he added an ingredient that is really provocative, making the shelters really, really bright. Usually what happens is that homeless people are non-existent to us. They are almost like disappearing. And instead, by making them this color, all of a sudden they are in your face. So this is a, a parking lot in downtown LA with some of these shelters that were installed. Another form of activism is changing the way we perceive certain characteristics of our society. It's a quite recent and amazingly powerful move that has brought 
people, so many people, from being considered disabled to being considered differently able. And it's interesting because this is how they're defined in Italy, for instance. And I really like to see how many amputees are working towards a completely different uh, definition of their own state. You might remember when Oscar Pistorius, whom we know right now is going through a really difficult trial, uh, was banned from the Olympic Games because his prosthesis made him faster than so-called normally abled human beings. In this case, you see the work of Sophie de Oliveira Barata, who's based in London, and she makes artificial limbs that are amazing sculptures that make so-called normally abled people almost jealous and make you feel that you could be that kind of superwoman. Of course, we know that it's not all that easy, but the effort to change things is a part of activism that is as subtle as it can be powerful. Activism is also, ooh, that's too bad that it's not working. It was working today. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll describe the video to you anyway. This is a series of uh, uh, limbs that can be composed by children that are amputees and can be made in almost like superpowers uh, limbs. So there's a video in which the kids, the, the, the friends of this particular kid that are helping him compose this superpower limb are like saying, oh my God, I want it too. So it's almost like this, this common play and envy. So you can put all of the different components on your artificial limb. Design is also, as I was mentioning to you before, about communicating. It's, it has to be communicative towards other human beings. Design is always for other human beings, even when it's really speculative and experimental, and it might seem like it's just for that particular moment. It's always for the betterment of the whole field and for other people. At least, I hope it is. And communication sometimes is very straightforward. I like design that are helping human beings communicate not only amongst themselves, but also with God. And these are a few, two examples that I particularly love. On the left-hand side is a little device that has been actually planted in a, a cloistered nun convent in northern England, and that helps the nun pray because it's connected to the BBC network. And so there's a ticker tape, a little bit like the one you would have in Times Square, that shows the nuns that are really cloistered, so don't have much contact with the outside world, what is going on in the world so they can pick right topics to pray about. And so they actually say that it helps them keep their prayers pertinent. And on, and, uh, on the right-hand side is instead um, a Muslim prayer mat that has an electroluminescent substrate and a compass module, so when it's turned in the right direction of Mecca, it lights up. Now, we all know where Mecca is. We don't need a compass to tell us, but it's this sign of subservience of technology to human rituals and human needs <clears throat> that I find particularly compelling. Technology should not lead us. Technology should be a tool for us to live more fully. You know, when people ask me, are you afraid that technology is making, is making us less human? I always say, no, no, it's us who are making technology more human. So it's a transference that can be beneficial to human beings. Um, other forms of communication are much more straightforward. You know, visualization design has become, um, has existed forever. We've been doing diagrams forever. The history of visualization design is normally taught beginning with the famous cholera map from the 19th century that enabled people to understand that a particular fountain in London was the source of the cholera epidemics just by gathering all the data and putting them on, on a map. So it's nothing new. But today, with the onslaught of data that we have, it's, been, it's become more and more important to be able to make sense of them. To make sense of them in different situations, whether it's for a wide audience or for a small group of scientists. This is a wind map that is actually available. It's about the United States. It's not about Canada, but it's available online for anyone. And I find it ex absolutely beautiful because it shows the winds over the territory of the United States as if they were caressing this kind of uh, virtual wheat field. So it's very, very... Uh, expressive and at the same time very correct because it's based on the um, on the um, on the National Meteorological Institute's data. 
You can also go back in time in the archive and look at some pretty strong phenomena like Hurricane Sandy or even Hurricane Katrina and see how the winds formed over the territory. It's completely open source, it's online, and it's done by two of the best visualization designers we have today, Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg. The whole field of visualization design, like any other design field, has a lot of uh, different practitioners with a few peaks, a few like sublime practitioners. And that's what I try to pluck like gorgeous flowers and bring to either into the collection or for the um, for display so that the audiences can see their work. Um, very important these days is the idea of thinkering, thinking with your hands, thinking, experimenting, the whole maker movement, all the do-it-yourself, the open source. This term, thinkering, was coined by John Seeley Brown. John Seeley Brown used to be the director of Xerox Park. Xerox Park was the Palo Alto Research Center where Xerox developed the mouse to begin with one example, or the graphic user interface that became the interface of the Macintosh. They developed the biggest discoveries of, our, of the past 50 years, but then they never really patented them or really used them. Somebody else snatched them from them. But it was an amazing place where they, all, they had great artists in residence and a lot of great ideas were formed by thinkering, by thinking with your hands. And thinkering is a very positive attitude that can lead to extremely negative, uh, negative results. I was stunned when I first heard about the 3D printed gun, as I'm sure you were too. I was so stunned that I began a whole new project about design and violence. I was stunned by the gun, and then I was stunned by my stupidity for being stunned, because I always thought in this kind of Pollyannish way that design is always a force for good, that everything that is designed is always for the betterment of society. Well, of course not. Of course things can go either way, but I hadn't thought about it. And something as good as 3D printing, okay, but open source, because that's what is at the basis of the 3D printed gun, the idea that open source should be available to everybody, and these files were available for anyone to download and to 3D print a gun at home. The idea that open source could go awry is something that hadn't crossed my mind before. So thinkering as a force, whether for good or for bad. Um, I tend to always stay in the realm of the digital, but truth is, all of these examples, all of these definitions and attitudes that I'm giving you can also be applied to furniture, can be applied to crafts. And when it comes to thinkering, I like to remember the project that put Martino Gamper on the international map. Martino Gamper, I'm sure many of you know, <clears throat> is an Italian designer living in London who has done really interesting work recuperating tradition and a manuality that had been lost. A hundred chairs in a hundred days is exactly what it sounds. He went around the streets of London, and every day for a hundred days he picked up stuff, and every day he made a chair out of it. This program became really famous, was sold by galleries, but it also kind of gave legitimacy to a whole group of designers that were trying to do something new with what was already there. The idea of upcycling and not only recycling, of reusing, of making beauty out of what was already found is as old as what we've seen in mashup on the third floor or fourth floor. Yeah, exactly. So I would say fourth floor. It's really at the beginning of the idea of mashing up. But it's brought back today in this very vital way. One, it sits side by side with visualization design and digital design. I also like to see what's happening in the thinkering with materials and with especially mushroom mycelium. Mushroom mycelium is the hero of today's making, together with seaweed and also with silkworms, I have to say. There's some obsessions that designers have, and mushroom mycelium is one. Um, we've seen how it was used to make a whole tower at MoMA by this uh, group called uh, The Living and David Benjamin, but there are many other artists and designers that are working with mushroom mycelium, in particular by mixing it together with cornstalk and growing it into shapes. But I also like how Maurizio Montalti, and more recently you might have seen also articles about another example, uh, that some designers are making burial shrouds that are meant to eat up the corpse 
more quickly. So it's about this kind of green burial and green funerals. So designers are tackling different materials and also very old rituals in different ways by trying and testing what's going to happen. Design is always constructive, or at least almost always constructive, which is also quite important. Sometimes constructive in a very literal way. Um, this is a 4D printed dress. What is 4D printing? 4D printing means printing, 3D printing something folded. You know, the problem with so many 3D printers is that the bigger the object, the bigger that you need to 3D print the object, and so it costs more. Kinematics, that's a duo in Cambridge, Massachusetts, found a way to actually take a particular design, fold it by using algorithms and software, and then print it folded so that it occupies a much smaller volume. So you print the dress like that, and then you pull it out of the 3D printer, and it just opens up almost like magic. In a way, the same wonderment that we have felt looking at ivory filigree from India, we feel looking at the work of a 3D printer. It seems like it's superhuman, and perhaps it is, just like the particular craftsman from India that did that sphere within the sphere within the sphere within the sphere with the elephant at, in the middle, is transposed into the making of an object like this, even though there's an in-between, there's a machine between the human being and the final product. But it's still about wonderment. And the way we construct has also changed. We're trying more and more to let objects build themselves and grow themselves. You know, organic design is something that we've been trying to pursue for our whole history. We've been trying to imitate nature because nature does it best. It shapes best, it shows best, and it also builds best. So there are many designers that are trying to find ways to almost make buildings and objects as if they were bread, with a starter that then grows into the shape that has been set as the basis for growth. So it's interesting to see that that way of construction is following into the organic line that has begun millennia ago. Organic sometimes means building materials, building new materials that really follow the way our body and the way nature wants them to behave. This is a brand new material that was developed at the MIT Media Lab last year that uses soybean and tofu and miso enzymes to create this layer that lets the vents of this particular, no, this particular suit open up when the skin becomes more moist. So when there's sweat, the suit opens up by itself. It's quite amazing, and it actually works. It's a really tricky uh, methodology to build it, but, you know, it'll become true. It'll take a little while, but it'll become true. At the same place, at the MIT Media Lab, Neri Oxman built this beautiful pavilion using 40,000 silkworms. I was telling you how the silkworm has become also one of the heroes of today's design. Basically, what uh, Neri and her students did is they studied the behavior of silkworms. They put them in a little cage and studied exactly how the silkworm behaves depending on temperature, light, and certain other conditions. And then once they learned everything about that behavior, they designed a diagram constructed so that the silkworms would make that pavilion that you see there which was installed at the MIT Media Lab for a few months. So, once again, it's about using nature not only as an imitation or as a model, but also as a force to build objects in a more organic way. It's an amazing project in which the silkworms basically are the contractors. They are the construction workers. You know, they are the 3D printers. So, all of a sudden, we really build the way nature wants us to build, and a completely biodegradable object. Gestures like the one that Neri did with the silkworms are, after all, political gestures. You know, when you grow up in Europe, especially in Italy, I sound a little bit like my big fat Greek wedding, but everything is politics. You know, everything that is 
beyond the nucleus of a family becomes politics. And so being political means living with other human beings, means being a citizen. And it's something that good designers never forget. Never forget even when they want to do something as completely crazy and provocative as human cheese. So this is the work of Cristina Gapakis, who's a bio-designer, and Cicel Tolas, who's an amazing scent artist. And it was part of an exhibition that happened at the Science Gallery in Dublin called Grow Your Own, which was about growing, you know, do-it-yourself biodesign. And by taking uh, some bacteria, either from the nose or from the armpit or some, of some famous curators, amongst them Hans Ulrich Obrist and a few others, they made cheese that was actually personalized, and it was like really disgusting. I know it's disgusting, but you know what? I think it's important to be disgusted sometimes, because once you're disgusted, then it stays with you. And that's what critical design is. It's, you know, critical design is about making you think that there are some taboos that you think you cannot cross, but then you can. For instance, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, <coughs> eating insects. I like them but they seem to be really like a taboo for so many. And I like the fact that designers try to transform our behavior with objects that can be really provocative. Other designs are political in a more uh, literal way. This is one of the first instances where when the internet really gave shivers down the spine of so many politicians in the United States. It was 2004, and it was called Josh On, and it was They Rule by Josh On. And it was... Um, an interface on the internet that connected corporate boards of the biggest companies of the United States amongst them, and then with uh, big committees in the government. So it kind of showed the possible conflicts of interest that had remained semi-hidden before because nobody had made those links. But once, once you have a tool like the internet, you can make those links, and all of a sudden what was hidden becomes completely visible. So beautifully uh, elegant and uh, very well realized and really provocative, this interface remains in the history of visualization design. Josh updated it after a few years, but it was never as perfectly clear as this was. So in a way, it remains as a paradigm. Being political sometimes means really changing or tr helping to change the attitudes of the world. This is one of my favorite objects that has gotten me into trouble more than once. Maybe it'll get me into trouble even here. We'll see. It's a menstruation machine. So it's a contraption that is meant to be worn by men uh, or by, you know, anybody who doesn't have menstruation and wants to try to have them. It's almost like a, a chastity belt. And it has electrodes that come down low on your abdomen and give you, and give you cramps. Um, and then it has a reservoir in the back. You know, you're supposed to draw your blood, put it in the back. And then there's a cannula that delivers it in between your legs. So you have all the discomfort. You have the pain. You have the cramps. You have the sense of bloatedness and weight. And you have the blood. And it's like a complete package. And it's the work... It's the work of Sputniko. Sputniko is a really interesting artist, designer, singer, musician. So she, is, she always does first the object, then she models the object. So this is Sputniko herself, but she is, uh, she is now in personifying Takashi. Takashi is a Japanese boy who wants to try being maybe a woman or at least having his or her period. So this, this whole fluidity that gives you almost, makes you almost dizzy. So that's Hiromi, woman, uh, that's portraying a boy that is wearing a menstruation machine. And then there's a music video in which Takashi goes around Tokyo with his girlfriend. She's a friend and she's a girl. They're not necessarily together. And she is singing the song saying, it hurts, right? And it's going to hurt even more. It's horrible, right? You'll see how worse it's going to get. It's this really, really strange um, uh, con contraption and this strange construction of emotions. I always found this object absolutely moving. It's revolting to some, and to me it's completely moving because menstruation it is one of the final barrier, one of the final frontiers for so many prejudices and for so many distances. So I loved this particular, um, uh, this particular example of political design, I think it is. And 
All of these designs are activist political, they're organic, they are about thinking, but many of them are visionary. And design that is visionary can really be incredibly helpful to push society forward. I love this also, this project by Aiha Sagawa. It's called Impossible Children. And it's about creating a whole scenario that shows what would happen if a couple of lesbians could have children of their own without any men in between. So no sperm, just direct parthenogenesis. And of course, it's impossible right now, but it's a whole construction of how, what would happen if. And that's the beauty of, of critical design. Critical design is about what if, and it explores possible consequences of our choices of today. The couple really exists. It's a Japanese woman and a French woman. They live in France. They didn't know that this was going to happen. And basically, what I did is she created a book where she uh, photoshopped these two kids, of course, they are girls, in the family life of the, of, the, of the couple, and then presented the couple with the book. It was just amazing to see the reaction. And it was not all positive. It was moving, but one of the, the two girls said that she didn't want to have children anyway. No matter what, it makes us think, it makes them think, and it shows what if. You know, the final frontier that we know right now is about getting men pregnant. We'll get there. But <laughs> before that happens, we can explore other possibilities. I love the fact that the people that are doing this kind of work call themselves designers, not artists. You might ask me when you see projects like this, what's the difference between design and art? At this point, it's so hard to tell. It, it really is not in the medium or in the means of expression. It's really in the cards that you declare on the table when you start the project. If you say that you're a designer, I'm going to look at your work as a designer, so I'm going to see how you achieve the goal that you set for yourself and how that helps the society. If you say that you're an artist, I'm going to pull my hair, arms up, my hands up, and just say, okay, no problem, whatever you want to say. But designers, we hold to a certain standard, to a certain reality check possibility. Being visionary sometimes instead means being absolutely pragmatic. It's the complete opposite. I'm showing you here the work of Project H. Project H is Emily Pilaton and Matthew Miller. They're a couple. They live in Half Moon Bay, down a few miles uh, on this coast. And uh, they came out of school in their late 20s, and they were just like really starry-eyed and wanted to make the world a better place. So they decided to do a socially engaged design practice. And they set out to see which problems were really urgent and which problems they could tackle. And what they did at first they decided to look at the hippo roller. The hippo roller that you see in this, small, uh, in this small image is a container for water that was developed by two South African engineers in the 1970s. It helps women and children, who usually are the ones in African villages that are in charge of moving water around, it helps them bring water from the stream to the village in a more comfortable way and more water at a time. They're basically rolling and can be pushed or pulled. They're not very pragmatic. You know, the two sides, the two parts that come together are not done with the same mold, so there are problems of stacking them to ship them. They're not super rational, but they had been working for like 30 plus years in Africa without problems. Matthew and Emily decided, let's go and make the hippo roller better. And with this sense of earnestness, but at the same time, a colonialism that they couldn't feel, but that they had, that they didn't know they had, they went and tried to change the production chain in Africa. Of course, it was a gigantic failure. And chapeau to them, they recognized, they acknowledged that it was a failure. So the next thing that they did is they went to North Carolina, to Windsor County, that's considered one of the poorest counties in the United States, and they embedded themselves with the community, within the community for a year, and helped the community, number one, understand design, but number two, more importantly, regain a sense of pride and agency. And that's what design can do sometimes. After a year, the community, and I'm talking about children and adults and elderly at the same time, had built a new farm stand for the community. And also they had designed a series of chicken coops that they started also selling in other counties to make a profit. So it's the opposite. Instead of going to the other side of the world to make the world a better place, you you act really locally and you try to see what design can do for a particular community. That's vision, too. 
It's vision because it also gives people a sense of responsibility. And design is first and foremost about responsibility. We've been thinking a lot about how to help the environment, how to be better uh, human beings, how to save resources without, uh, without penalizing the quality of life that we all have and by improving also the quality of life of others. There are so many designers these days that are doing a little bit what Emily and Matthew did and looking at what is already here in our belly, in our tradition, in our material culture and reviving it so that we can act more holistically. Forma Fantasma is a duo of Italian designers that live and work in the Netherlands, and their work is poetic and incredibly meaningful and deep, and is based on trying to understand more about material culture. One of my favorite projects is this one called Botanica, in which they recuperated resins from the pre-oil history era, so before oil was used, before hydrocarbons became the controlling substance of our society, they tried to look at shellac, they tried to look at resins that used straw and beeswax, and they tried to show people how to make these resins. There were instances in which, at the Salone del Mobile in Milan, they would be in the basement of the Rinascente, which is the big department store in Milan, the basement where all the housewares are, and they would be cooking these big cauldrons as if it were Macbeth, and you know, fumes would be going everywhere. Anywhere in the world, United States or Canada, they would be shut off in two seconds, and like crowds of people learning how to make these resins and inhaling all the fumes. But it was really quite moving because there was really an attempt to teach people how to make their own materials. We go back to mutant materials. Responsibility is also, at the scale of architecture and at the scale of infrastructure, um, thinking of reinsertion of society and prison design is an amazing example of uh, responsible design. We're talking here about the Halden prison in Norway, which has become one of the most well-known prisons in the world, not only because it's so well designed and because it's so um, generous and, uh, and forward-looking, but also because it's the prison with Peter Opsvik, who's the murderer of the island, the one that killed so many um, Norwegians, is kept. But we see here that there's a completely different idea about what a prison is. In a way, the idea is that being kept away from society is punishment enough, and it's not about humiliating a person or driving the person into the ground, but rather giving the person a sense of the possibility of reinsertion in society. So something to look forward to and to, um, to get better for rather than just a punishment. So responsible design is about very pragmatic issues, and sometimes instead it's about non-pragmatic ones. The opening slide of this lecture was taken by this project that I love. It's so hard to explain the work of Revital Cohen and Turban Balin, so I'm sure that I will just like make a, a big mess up, but I will try nonetheless. Revital and Tour always look at the way we use resources, and sometimes they tackle um, the way we use precious earths in computers. Other times they tackle biodesign and the concept of hybrid, in particular in this case. In this case, they decided to look at the tradition of hybridized goldfish that exists in Japan and in China. And they worked with a doctor, with a scientist, to build a machine that can make this hybridized fish in a series. So it's almost like industrial production of sterile hybridized goldfish. And we acquired the blueprints for this machine for the Museum of Modern Art. Um, what this is, is an attempt to look at the uh, industrial complex of biodesign and synthetic biology from a critical standpoint. Biodesign has become really well spread, and there are so many practitioners, but there's still a lot of ethical doubt about it that needs to be um, tackled, discussed, and that is what critical designers do. They put a big question mark on the whole practice by means of really beautiful and well-drawn uh, projects such as this one. Sensitivity to our future, to where we're going, to the human dimension, is also important for contemporary design. 
The work that you see here is by Diller Scofidio Renfro, the architects that are now expanding also the Museum of Modern Art in New York, who before they could build buildings were doing a lot of visualization design, were doing a lot of architectural work within the digital realm. They worked on this beautiful exhibition by Paul Virilio many years ago at the Fondation Cartier in Paris that was all about migration. The idea behind it was that humanity today is defined by big movements of people that change their location because of either humanly made or natural disasters. And Diller Scofidio, with the aid of many visualization artists and designers, had done this big theater in which they showed all the big migrations that have happened in the past 70 years and what they have entailed for the world in terms of environmental changes and also economic changes. So it was a big, big visualization that all of a sudden gave this clin d'oeil, this vision, this ensemble vision of the dynamics of mankind. And this was just reused, actually updated, of course, for COP21, for the Paris gathering of last year, to show what the impact of these big masses of people moving around the world has been in the past decade. So really important to give a sensitivity of what's happening, to show the sensitivity of the human scale. But once again, sensitivity is also at the level of the individual and at the level of the needs, of the spiritual needs of the individual. Many designers these days are working on death. It's really interesting because death is having a moment. I mean, it's kind of weird to say it this way, but there are many designers that are taking funeral licenses. I visited one in Melbourne, Pia, Pia Interlandi, that is working with people that are about to die to decide what they're going to wear when they die, and they do special shrouds, special um, dresses. There's another designer that is in Los Angeles that designs funerals. It's very strange to see, but the first time I saw this phenomenon was to, in 2006, and it was the Eindhoven Academy of Art and Design who had installed this beautiful exhibition in Milan that was all about death. The students had worked on death for a whole year, and it was really touching uh, a very sensitive spot because one of the students who had chronicled her own disease for the whole year died before making it to the show. So it was just a the first time that I saw design being so raw and being so openly um, in touch with, our, with the things that we don't like to talk about most of the time. And it was a school, moreover. I was really impressed by that and uh, impressed by the courage that the teachers and the directors of the school had had. Sometimes the sensitivity is about really dark and tragic situations. What you see here is the Public Practice Studio, which is a group of students that designed this concept for trafficked women. The only time trafficked women can be by themselves is in the bathroom. So the designers had hidden in sanitary pads all of these instructions and phone numbers that the women could call to get rescued, to get help. So. Uh, quite beautiful to see also that design in this case is about tackling in a very subtle way a very important issue. But as it is sensitive, design also has to be sensible. We're talking about design here, not art. So there has to be a connection with reality. There has to be a way to tackle real issues. You might have seen this particular object by Masoud Hassani, Mein Kafon. It's a detonator for landmines, and Masoud designed it as a thesis, for his, uh, as a thesis in, uh, in 2011 when he was 26 years old. Masoud was born in Afghanistan, in the north of Afghanistan, in an area that had a lot of landmines and minefields. So he grew up with this knowledge that there were places where not only he couldn't go, but not even the toys that he would build to race them the, the, with his friends and with his brother that were these paper-made, wind-powered rollers, not even these objects could go on the minefields and, because then they couldn't be retrieved. So when he grew up and he had to do his thesis project, he dug back into his childhood and thought about his, uh, his practice, his games when he was a child and built a wind-powered object that could be rolled onto minefield and could explode the landmines. So it's made of bamboo and then 
a few rotation molded feet and a core. So it's light enough that it can be powered by the wind, but heavy enough that it can explode landmines. And the materials are cheap enough and easy to find enough. I mean, bamboo can be found pretty much all over the world. It's almost invasive. So it was really done in this very rational way. And at the beginning, there was a lot of research. He was working with the Dutch um, army because also he went to the Academy of Eindhoven. And then the project was stopped and there was a lot of criticism because it was considered almost too pretty to be real. Let's not go there. I think the intentions were really good at, hey, it was a thesis project. So uh, sometimes people become a little demanding of designers, like, you know, form has to follow function. Okay, yeah, in this case it does. So Maya Pedal is a, a beautiful outfit in Guatemala. Uh, it's also interesting to see how many different parts of the world uh, have become very important for designers to draw from, especially so-called developed country. You know, this developed under, underdeveloped is also always so weird, but um, developing countries are the ones where uh, you don't throw away any part of the animal, you eat everything. Italy used to be a developing country, maybe it still is. Um, but that's what I like to see here. Maya Pedal is a company that takes all sorts of bicycle leftover parts and makes them into agricultural machines or machines that are uh, for the house. So it's really a beautiful way to reuse uh, all the parts of the mechanical animal. Pragmatism is also what drives many designers still. And it's the driving point in also visionary experimentation such as this. This institute is a great institute at Harvard that is about scientific research. And these people don't call themselves the designers. I just decide they are because the object is so fantastic. Sometimes I just like call them in. Um, but what you see here is uh, a series called Organs on Chips. By using nanoparticles of certain organs of our bodies and silicon chips, this institute has created this models that enable the pharmaceutical industries to test, to jump a few steps in the, pharm in the test of new medicines and therefore save a lot of money so without damaging um, too many living beings. So there's a liver on chips, a lung on chip, there's a heart on chip, they're working on pancreas, but it's about simulating and modeling reactions of different body organs to different medications. And the pragmatism also goes into architecture in the work of Elemental Chile. Um, Alejandro Aravena won the Pritzker Prize this year. He's one of the principals of this company in Chile. And he's also going to do the architecture biennial that I'm going to go see in a few weeks in Venice. Um, usually, you know, we, architects tend to have big egos, right? You know, they're not really known as like shy little violets that stay in the background. Uh, they like to put their stamp onto buildings for themselves to be remembered and to really make a mark. Well, Elemental is quite the opposite. Chile has an interesting system whereby every citizen gets given a once-in-a-lifetime subsidy by the state to buy their first home. Uh, they have to put a little bit of money into it, so they have to invest some of their own money, but then the state gives them the most of the money, and it's about $20,000. What Elemental does is it creates these buildings that are almost like a three-dimensional canvas. They're starter homes, so they're two floors, and then you can add onto that your own balconies, lodges, you can add another floor, and they're arranged around a cul-de-sac so they're almost like the starters of a community. And it's a very different way to think about architecture that I find really compelling. The pragmatism of designers sometimes can become really paradoxical. What you see here are images from the, um, from the protest in Taksim Square in Istanbul in 2013. It was really interesting because I kept on looking at these pictures and I couldn't understand why protesters were squeezing soap into each other's eyes. I really couldn't understand. Until I realized that that was not soap, it was milk, that they would squeeze into each other's eyes in order to counteract the effects of, of tear gas. So uh, it was almost like a form of redesign of an object that gave pause and then they also made it into um, an exhibition that they would take around. So finding this kind of irony in the reuse of an object for a different purpose is something that is pragmatic and also lyrical at the same time. Ambivalence, you know, we're talking about today. And 
I'm trying to write an essay, I've been working on it for a while, but it's filled with platitudes still, I'm going to get there at some point, about quantum design. You know, what, quantum is about ambivalence, ambiguity, the idea that you can be in one place and in the other at the same time, there's an entanglement uh, um, that it, between bodies that are far away, so it's all very poetic, but it's not that easy to understand and not that easy to apply to design, but I'll get there at some point. What I find really interesting is that many designers are embracing the fluidity that we are experiencing in our social life, also when it comes to design. I really love Slow and Steady Wins the Race. It's a, a very special fashion company in New York. They started out by making in white canvas things like the Hermes Kelly bag or other really famous, you know, it's almost like a, an, art, uh, an art performance, right? So you do a Kelly bag in floppy white canvas. Well, they, were, they got a cease and desist from her mess, so like, whoa, they became everybody's heroes. Um, I really like how they come out with things like the white t-shirt collection, and it's black t-shirts and mesh t-shirts. So they're very conceptual, but at the same time, they show you all of these game of possibilities that objects have. It's almost like talking about entanglement in design today. But the ambivalence also is in the ethical possibilities of design. I was telling you before that, um, I, we've been, that we have been really considering biodesign at MoMA. And uh, indeed, we acquired just a few months ago the first 3D printed virus in history. It's not really 3D printed, but it's designed using software. The virus is always the same. It's the famous bacteriophage that has been used by scientists to make models uh, for many, many decades. But Autodesk, which is the company that has been uh, developing, that has that released AutoCAD and so many other automatic modeling and printing um, uh, devices for many, many decades, has now developed a software and a machine to actually digitally produce viruses. And interestingly, what we have acquired at MoMA is what we would acquire for an architecture. You know, architecture can never be acquired. You always acquire a representation of the architecture, whether it's a model or a drawing. And in this case, we acquired a 3D printed model of the virus. So I find it very interesting. But the designer, actually the scientist that developed this virus, uh, developed it so that it can deliver medication for cancer in a very aimed and targeted way, a little bit like, you know, Incredible Journey, the movie. But then, Andrew, the same scientist, also wrote a beautiful essay for The Atlantic talking about hacking the president's DNA. So this idea of ambivalence, of understanding that what you design and what you produce can go one way or the other, gives more responsibility also to the people that, to, to all of us, you know, understanding what the consequences could be. But this idea of fluidity and ambiguity is best represented by what's going on in the world right now. The person you see here is Juliana Huxtable. Juliana is a transgender artist in New York City, and this is the way they wanted to be represented when they were shown in the biennial, in the Whitney biennial, biennial last year. Um, I find the way we design ourselves and our presence in the world the ultimate example of contemporary design, of this ambivalence and ambiguity that I started out with at the beginning, with this new dynamic state of design that makes it be not anymore about problem solving, but sometimes about problem finding. Um, at MoMA, I run also Department of Research and Development, and we have these salons that are about topics that are very relevant to the outside world, but in which the museum has something to contribute, to which the museum has something to contribute. And one of the best salons that we did was about the topic of fluidity. So many of us today are grappling with a world that's becoming more and more fluid. We're grappling with it because maybe we cannot make sense of what we see, we're trying to adapt, or we are leading this fluidity. And I think that that particular effort is when we all, each one of us, becomes a designer, a designer of the way we see the world and of the way we also paint the world. And that's when this particular idea of design moving from A to B, from a static position to 
Instead, a dynamic position is important. This idea of the entanglement and the quantum dimension that design can achieve is where we want to be. We want to try to be in the middle. We want to try to be able to see design in the past and in the future and be very well rooted in the present. And I'm going to end with this image of a quantum computer, or at least what a quantum computer could look like if we could see it and we didn't have to take it out of a hydrogen liquid tank, as an inspiration for all of us. We need to be really nimble on our feet, but we also need to know where we stand, and design is our tool to build a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you.